All right, spiritual gifts. Everybody gets to play. Now, as I mentioned over the last couple of weeks, this is where you find the spiritual gifts. Hebrews 5 is something that not everybody includes, but this is where I think God lays the foundation for spiritual gifts, where he says, this is all about unity. This is all about taking who we are. And as I mentioned in the, service, the sermon, when you got baptized, it's like your activation code. And when somebody says that spiritual gifts are only among believers, it doesn't mean that when you are singing, with the moment you step outside the church, you can't sing or play guitar or administrate or any of the other things. What it means is that God has given you these particular gifts so that when you are inside the body of Christ, they become a way for individuals to build up the body, meaning the church. This doesn't necessarily mean the church, this location is going to grow. It means that you take who you are and what you are, and you're able to use them for the sake of the larger picture. And this becomes important when we realize that our ministries, so during COVID, we were already, quote unquote, an international church. Now, this isn't to ex make our heads explode or, or have everybody pat us on the back. But starting 30 years ago, we were offered opportunities to work with churches all over the world. We actually planted a church in Okinawa. We had a Navy chaplain that was leaving here. He was going to Okinawa. He got there and discovered a lot of expat Lutherans who were looking for a church. They needed funding and they needed somebody to sponsor him, sponsor them. We did. We got a church off the ground. And all we did was pray, contribute, and then provide things that were necessary for them to start a church. We've worked with churches in Africa. So when COVID came, we'd already been, uh, we've already been on the web since 2000. We've already had podcasts for a number of years. It became this momentary change. I was at a meeting in California when everything was breaking loose. California was literally shutting down. I got out just in time. I called Kayla from the Balboa Park uh, BART station, and I said, tomorrow's our last Sunday in worship. We're going online. And I said, uh, I'm, I know Monday's your day off, but I said, we need to do a strategy meeting on Monday, or we can do it Saturday, Sunday afternoon. And we realized that starting that Wednesday night, which was Lent, we were going to have to go online. We grabbed what we had. We did our best to make it work. During the highest parts of COVID, we had over 200 people watching our services a week from all over the place, not just people on island. We're down to, what, 20 to 30 views a week now on, on just the worship services. And again, we have people in various places. We have a couple of families in Alaska and a couple of families on the East Coast. And, and what this is about is understanding that our church is no longer just this location. This is not about us trying to sheep steal or, or change the world. This is about us saying that we have gifts, talents, and abilities. Daniel keeps working on how to best reach out and work with a world that is changing rapidly. One of the things we discovered yesterday was nobody under the age of 30 is using our online giving, mostly because they don't do that kind of stuff. They use Venmo. So we've got to figure that out. One of the things we also realized was different changes in how people view the service. So that's when we started doing just the sermon on YouTube versus the entire service that's also available on our website. We also offer it in a written form, in an MP3. This is not us trying to look like we're a big church. This is us saying, we realize that in a few extra minutes of work each week, we can provide a variety of sources for various people. So the last two weeks, I was preaching at Christ Lutheran Church in Hilo, even though I was here. Pastor Zier was on vacation. While he was on vacation, he took two of the sermons off our website he had an elder who did the liturgy, and I provided the sermon. You know, it's one of those things you look at that and you say, this is something that, to be honest, we wouldn't have thought of 10 years ago. But 
we also have the ability, thanks to the specific gifts, time, and talent that's in this congregation to do these kind of things. And that's where Hebrews 5 comes in. Romans, 1 Corinthians, and Ephesians, that's where it actually lists out all the gifts. Now, last week we got started and we went through a couple of them, but this week we're going to start with discernment. Now, discernment is a tough gift. The Greek word for the gift of discernment is diachrisis. The word describes being able to distinguish, discern, judge, or appraise a person, statement, situation, or environment. In the New Testament, it describes the ability to distinguish between spirits, as in 1 Corinthians 12.10, and to discern good and evil, as in Hebrews 5.14. When you have the gift of discernment, it means by listening, you do more than just hear the words. By looking at someone's face, you have the ability to look at an individual and have an idea what they're saying and why they're saying it. When we deal with homeless individuals who walk into our office, the moment that they have a very polished story, it tells me several things. They have told this story over and over again. It is something that they have rehearsed. And number three, it is something that they have magnified to get the most gut punch so that we're motivated. A number of years ago, I walked into the office, Jerry introduced me to a guy, and this guy had told the most amazing story. His son had been killed in action in Afghanistan, and the United States government was not going to pay to ship his body back to the United States. And he needed $1,000 from our church in order to transport his son's body back so that it could be buried. Now, Jerry, bless her heart, because she had a heart as big as Texas, is listening to this guy and all that he's saying. And I walk in the door and kind of interrupt it. And I said, well, give me just a minute. I called one of our chaplains and I said, I need your son's name. I also need his ID number. Why would you need that? I said, I'll take care of it. I'll get it shipped back right away. I said, I guarantee that this chaplain, who's a Navy captain, can make a phone call because I said, if your son really was in the United States military and was killed in action, they will bring his body back. The man says, I'll be right back. I, I have to get some of that information in the car. He went out to his car and left. See, there's things that you know. This, this, this isn't me having the gift of discernment. This is me listening to a story and saying, this is not true. And there's a difference between those who are so open and so wanting to give and those of us who unfortunately have experience. Mine is experience. I don't have necessarily the gift of discernment. But if you have the gift of discernment, it means that when somebody comes and they're talking to you, you can figure out whether what they're saying is actually what they mean. The Holy Spirit gives the gift of discernment to enable certain Christians to clearly recognize and distinguish between the influence of God, Satan, the world, and the flesh in a given situation. The church needs those with this gift to warn believers in times of danger or keep them from being led astray by false teaching. Now, the, the verses that I'm giving you at the bottom, and by the way, all of this, Daniel will have it up online in, in just, you know, within a day or two. And so you can look all those up. But there have been times, if you remember, so much of the New Testament is filled with, and do not follow so-and-so who's trying to lead you astray. And do not follow this person because this person is trying to. And then if you'll remember, there was an individual who had been a seer, a magi, a magician, whatever you want to call it. The Bible says he starts to follow the Christian uh, disciples. And then one day he walks up and he says, I see how you're able to heal people. How much do you want me to give in order to buy this ability from you? And Peter turns to him and says, you just crossed the line. And I hope that God doesn't kill you for it. In other words, you can't buy these gifts. Evangelism. All Christians are called to evangelize and reach out to the lost with the gospel, but some are given an extra measure of effectiveness. Please note the old Spider-Man axiom, with great power comes great responsibility, and we want to thank Uncle Ben for that. But when we talk about evangelism, there's a difference between you're at the office and somebody suddenly says, you're not going to believe this, my son, my daughter, my husband, my grandmother, my father, 
whatever. There's a difference between you saying, can I just say a short prayer for you? Or peace be with you. There's a Bible verse that says that's witnessing. We should all be able to do that given a moment. The gift of evangelism is far more beyond that. The gift of evangelism is when somebody has the ability to sit down with somebody and talk across cultures and everything else in order to tell them the story of Jesus. We'll, we'll get to that in the next slide. But we had a DCE intern a number of years ago who had this gift to the extreme. On his day off, he would go sit at a park with his Bible, wait for somebody to sit down, and was able to, without scaring them off, get them to agree so that he could tell them the story of Jesus. Now, by the way, this is very uncommon in the Lutheran church. You don't see this a lot. It, it became very obvious that whereas he was training to be a DCE, his real gift was being a missionary. After he graduated, he spent several years in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area working with the large number of African immigrants in those neighborhoods. From there, he moved to India. From India, he's been moving all over the place. Now he's in Saudi Arabia. But he has, he has the gift of evangelism. Now, the reason this is important to recognize when somebody has the gift of evangelism is because it means the rest of us get to take a step back and take a deep breath because our witness is going to come very different. Our witness is going to come through the way we live, not as perfect people, but as forgiven people. Big difference between living by grace, okay, and simply saying when somebody says, well, you're not much of a Christian. I saw you doing this the other day. Yeah, and I told God I was sorry. And our job is to help people understand the connection between grace, forgiveness, and us not being perfect people. That's where we're more interested in, because when people want us to be perfect, it means they don't understand the scriptures, and we have to help them understand that, and that's not easy. It's more important that we say, look, you need to know I'm no different than you are. The difference is God forgave me, and he wants to forgive you, can I spend just two minutes telling you about Jesus? But when we get to the gift of evangelism, in Luke 16, 10, whoever is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and whoever is unrighteous in very little is also unrighteous in much. So if you have not been faithful with the unrighteous money, who will trust you with what is genuine? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you what is your own? The spiritual gift of evangelists is found in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, where Paul says that Jesus, and he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. Now, the passage from Luke is made to remind us that if we have been given these great gifts, we're expected to use them. And oftentimes people will say, God, I need the gift of, or God, I want the gift of, or God, I want you to increase my gift. But when we are praying that, what we're really saying is, God, I, I, I know what gift you gave me, but I would much rather have this gift. Or if you will increase this gift, I'll be able to do even more. Uh, a bunch of years ago, we used to send Bibles to Africa um, and it was interesting because we all of a sudden got all these requests for a very specific, very expensive version of the Bible. But one pastor said, um, instead of a Bible, could you send me a motor scooter that I might be able to spread the word of God faster? And we had to say, no, sorry, we, 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 we're, we don't have, because we also knew, by the way, if we gave him a motor scooter, we would have a thousand emails the next day all asking for motor scooters. But when they wanted this particular version of the Bible, it was a version that we don't use. And like I said, very expensive. So I called one of my missionary friends and he says, oh, those are very sought after. I guarantee if you ship 10 copies, they will be sold for an awful lot of money. He says, real evangelists in Africa are willing to use whatever they have. He says, but people have learned churches are willing to be generous and they'll do this. The gift of evangelism requires the gift of discernment. When we know someone and we meet someone either for the first time or someone that we've known for a long time, 
The gift of discernment, working with the gift of evangelism, allows us to know how to enter into a conversation with them in a way that we don't scare them off and we actually bring peace to them. It's the whole take a deep breath thing. It also means when we become friends with ind individuals, because by the way, the gift of evangelism usually means that somebody is very good at making friends and having relationships. Because the key to evangelism is always a relationship. I can walk over to the mall right now and start yelling John 3.16 and quoting Bible passages. Most people are simply going to walk past me and talk about the crazy guy in the mall. Where we get the chance is when we step into a situation and somebody is lost, somebody is searching, somebody is hurting, and we walk in, and instead of quoting Bible passages, the first thing we do is we just say, you don't look like you're doing well. Is there anything I can do? They have to sense from us that we're not trying to sell them something. We're not trying to push anything on them. We're actually there to help. And the moment that they ex understand that we're there in a helping capacity, we've now opened up two lines of communication. That's what evangelism is. During the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s, evangelism was knocking on doors, putting out pamphlets, holding revivals. All of that, by the way, was simply moving people who were already Christians, but perhaps had not been active in a church for a while, and all we were doing was we were moving people around to the various churches. We were getting people who had, you know, been hurting a little bit. We'd take them to a revival. We would give them a great emotional experience. And then, you know, six months later, we'd come back and they would re-give their life to Jesus again. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this, okay? I understand why people do this. But evangelism is something very different. Evangelism is when you work with individuals, often one-on-one -on -one or small groups, in order to get them a basic understanding of who they are and what sin is and what grace is. Then we move on, by the way, to discipleship, and we'll, we'll get to that later. But evangelism is simply introducing people to the gospel in such a way that they now know that there's a God who loves them and that there's a person on this earth who loves them. The Greek word for evangelist is eugalistis, which means one who brings good news. This word is only found in two other places in the New Testament, Acts 21.8 and 2 Timothy 4.5. Evangelists are given the unique ability by the Holy Spirit to clearly and effectively communicate the gospel of Jesus to others. Key word, clearly and effectively. They are burdened in their hearts for the lost and will go out of their way to share the truth with them. Evangelists are able to overcome the normal fear of rejection and engage not believers in meaningful conversation about Jesus. Their gift may be broad to all people or narrow, specific ethnic or cultural group. So, if, you know, if we don't get it nearly as often as we used to, but how many of you remember having either the Mormons or the Jehovah Witnesses on your doorstep? Okay. Now, they both, by the way, go through specific training on how to accept rejection because they are going to be rejected probably 25 out of 50 times at least. And the other 25, by the way, are going to be marginal. Now, the Mormons have a little more leeway. They're a little bit better known. And by the way, the moment that they start saying, you know, family is important to us. We also want to help you financially make sure that you are prepared for anything. So there's things that they offer that people will say, well, come in and talk to me more about this. Now on Saturday, was it Saturday that Jehovah Witnesses were across the street? Yeah, yesterday. Anyway, Jehovah Witnesses love to go over there and they got this little umbrella and they have all of their tracks out. Jehovah Witnesses, by the way, a blue collar organization. And by the way, their biggest thing was once upon a time, they actually said there's only going to be X number of people, the 144,000 in heaven. The problem was when they hit 144,000 and one, now they got a problem. And so they had to redo a little bit of their thought process. But the Jehovah Witnesses are very specific. Blue collar, they don't celebrate birthdays. They don't celebrate Christmas or Easter. They don't do holidays. And so, you know, but their tracks, the Watchtower, very specifically targeted to blue collar people, 
people especially that are poor who feel like they have been left out of the world and of everything. And here, they, this is going back to the old days when we sang spirituals after uh, the Civil War about nobody knows the trouble I've seen. And this is where you'll get the Jehovah Witnesses. So they would come to the door, knock on the door, and they want to hand you the tracts. They want to talk to you. They want to pray with you. And they're going to get rejected most of the time. They had to be working through that. And as they worked through it, they had to be understanding that when they got someone, that it was very important. But they had to be willing. They were always very well dressed. The Mormon missionaries, remember, they always have the little black name tag, white shirt, thin tie, black pants. The girls were, women were always wearing nice dresses. And, you know, this is, this is something that they're used to. Evangelists are okay with being rejected. They have to be because they also understand that they're planting seeds. My job is not to go and save 50 people today. My job is to plant seeds with 50 people so that in a moment, somebody walks up and says, you know, I've told you the story about our neighbors who worked for the Secret Service. And one night, somebody rings our doorbell and I go to the door. And the first thing I say is, you're a pastor, right? All they wanted to do was give us mangoes that had come off the tree. No papayas, whatever it was. Anyway, some fruit. And they had a whole bag of it that we brought to church and then we gave to the food bank out in Waianae. But the fact that they knew I was a pastor was important. We've had others that have called up and said, you're that pastor I met at so-and-so's wedding or so-and-so's funeral. Can I talk to you? All we do sometimes is scatter the seed so that when they need someone, they say, okay, now I'm open. I'd like to talk to you. That's what an evangelist does, constantly sowing seeds. And as Jesus said, we know that some of it's going to fall on sidewalks and immediately, you know, be useless. Some of it's going to spring up, but it's shallow soil. Some of it is going to get choked out by the weeds and some of it will blossom. And this is evangelists are constantly sharing and planting seeds. They continually seek relationships with those who don't know Jesus and are open to the leading of the Holy Spirit to approach different people. If you'll remember in the first part of the book of Acts, God uh, is, you know, has told him, go out and make disciples of all nations. The apostles pretty much go to the cities because there's tons of people. And remember, first, they primarily worked among the Jews. And yet Philip, Philip is told to go out into the middle of the desert. Now, Going back to my Baptist days where every week people would show up to church and say, I led nine people to Jesus this week. I led three people to Jesus this week. You know, and this whole thing, they were always, you know, the number of people that were led to Jesus. So, you know, all the disciples that are in the cities are saying, man, we, we saved 5,000, 6,000 were added to the church that day and you know, all this. And then there's Philip who goes out into the middle of the desert. And it's like, how many people are in the middle of the desert? And the answer is almost none. But he runs across one person who happens, happens to be the Ethiopian eunuch, who is the treasurer for Queen Candace of Ethiopia. And, and he's reading about Jesus. And he says, I don't understand. And Philip explains it to him. And he says, can I be baptized? Yes, let's go. And he baptized him. And then it says, Philip was snatched away and sent elsewhere. The Ethiopian eunuch went back to Candace and said, I got to tell you about Jesus. And it becomes the first Christian nation as a whole, planting churches everywhere. And so he, when he got back, you know, everybody's like, hey, we had 5,000 added to the church. And Philip goes, yeah, I had one. But that one was what God needed. They love giving themselves away for Jesus, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. And it brings them great joy, knowing that they are the feet that bring good news. That's from Isaiah 52. Exhortation. Now, this is the spiritual gift of exhortation is often called the gift of encouragement. The Greek word for the gift is parakleo. It means to beseech, exhort, call upon, encourage, strengthen, paraclete. It's someone who comes alongside you. In Acts 4, it says, Joseph, a Levite and a Cypriot by birth, the one the apostles called Barnabas, which is translated son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, brought, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, the one that they call the son of encouragement. In other words, this is the guy that you want working in the office because when you're having the worst day of the world and you show up at work, you know that he is going to be there with a cup of steaming coffee just the way you like it, or in my case, iced tea. And when you walk in and he's going to hand it to you and the first thing he's going to do, he's going to speak words that just make you feel 
like everything's going to be okay. This is the gift of exhortation. The primary means of exhortation is to remind the hearer of the powerful and amazing work of God in Christ, particularly in regard to the saving work of Jesus. We see Paul commanding Titus to use this gift in Titus 1.9 and throughout chapter 2, particularly Titus 2.11-15. 2, he also charges Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2 because he says, this is what I need you to do. So obviously, Timothy had the gift of exhortation. And Paul's saying, this is your time to go out and be you for the sake of the gospel. The key word is proclamation. You speak the truth in love. Now, the reason that we use the word proclamation, pastors on Sunday technically proclaim the word of God. To proclaim means I'm simply telling it to you. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not trying to prove it. I'm simply speaking it because the spirit is to work in your heart to bring about that which is truth and necessary. We're not about debating. We're not about arguing. We proclaim it. This is exhortation. Jesus was born. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. If somebody wants to argue at this point now, this is where we have to move on. We need somebody with a different gift. We had the funeral at a punch bowl on Thursday for uh, uh, Mert. And uh, you know, it's one of those things when you're at a funeral, there are people there that haven't been to church for a while. and your job is not to hammer them, it's to remind them of Jesus. And this is important. All we have to do, and so I read the passage that I love to read at Easter, where it simply says, you know, if all we have is the hope of Jesus in this world, we're to be pitied more than anybody else. Because if you say that nobody's ever been raised from the dead, then that means either God lied or we're lying. And if, by the way, if nobody's raised from the dead, that means that we're not going to be raised from the dead. And, you know, the, he, he, Paul is saying, do you see how this works? And he says, but we actually have Jesus. Therefore, and then he goes off to talk about the Easter miracle. That's proclamation. My job is not to convince you in the sense of arguing with you until we get down to the point where I've run you into the ground, you have no more objections, and you have to say, well, I guess now I have to believe you. That's not what God wants. God wants the Spirit to move in and through your heart to bring about the gift that the Spirit is willing to give you. Spirit of God gives this gift to people in the church to strengthen and encourage those who are wavering in their faith. Those with the gift of exhortation can uplift and motivate others, as well as challenge and rebuke them in order to foster spiritual growth and action. The goal of the encourager is to see everyone in the church continually building up the body of Christ and glorifying God. So there is this YouTuber. His name is John Christ. He is a comedian. He got into trouble a few years ago and lost his ministry, and he's coming back now. And he does this thing, it's called First Time Visitors. And he and his buddy, who he grew up with, who happens to be black, they travel all over the United States. And now they're actually branching out and going to churches out in the world. And they walk in and they visit these churches for the very first time. And they use their gift of sarcasm to talk about it before they get there. They read all the Yelp reviews of churches. And then they show up. And here's what they want to do. They want to find out, were we, are we welcomed? Do we understand what's happening? Um, and, and by the way, as they're driving, they will roll their windows down and tell people at, at, at the stoplights, hey, we're trying to find this church. Do you know where it is? Because that's telling people that's, you know, does the people in the community know about this church? And a lot of times people will say, oh, yeah, 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 you missed it. It's back there. Or, yeah, just go down here and turn left. You can't miss it. And a lot of the churches they go to, they've gone to a cowboy church, and they've gone to uh, the, the World Changers uh, and all of these churches. But the one that they went to last week down in Central America, 8,000 people, they go into church, and everybody there are 150 people in dressed in total white up on the stage dancing and singing and twirling things and there are people in the congregation playing show, uh, shofars you know the big uh, ram's horn that, that the jews and the entire family is blowing that and people are dancing and it's interesting because they walk in and they said he says you know we always talk about praise and worship and he said at this church it's very obvious that praise take place for like an hour and a half, where they just sing and dance and blow their horns and they wave giant flags and all of this is going on. And then he says, all of a sudden, it's like the switch is flipped. They take the offering 
And then the pastor gets up to preach and everything settles down. And then the pastor preaches for another 45 minutes to an hour. Service is three hours long. But he talked about the fact, he says, that first hour and a half, he said, all they're doing is singing and dancing and talking with one another and fellowshipping with one another and enjoying one another. And then they get to worship. And it was just this interesting concept, you know, that it's like, so when I first got here 34 years ago, the first 10 minutes of worship was to be before worship started. All of you were supposed to get here 10 minutes early, come in, sit in total silence with your head bowed, your hands folded while you listen to the organ. And you were supposed to spend 10 minutes just preparing your life for worship. That lasted for about 15 years. And the congregation that I inherited when I got here all PCS'd or moved. And then we had this whole new congregation and a whole new generation. And all of a sudden, individuals, because none of you work or live near one another, because we literally have people coming from all four corners of the island, you were showing up and here's what was happening. You were sitting down and all of a sudden you looked in front of you and you realized you didn't see him last week and you tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, we missed you last week. Oh, I was watching my football game or I didn't feel well or we were on vacation and now you're having this conversation and then there's other people over here having a conversation and people back there having a conversation and there was all this fellowship that was taking place inside the sanctuary and it was driving Myra crazy. And I had to say, okay, so I told everybody, everybody stay outside in the narthex and have the conversations. Now Myra's crazy because guess what? Nobody's inside listening to her music. And I said, okay, it's, you're going to have to accept one or the other because I can't control these folks. They want to have fellowship and it's important for us to have fellowship. They need to encourage one another. And if we, if we can't do it in here, I said, so I wouldn't play louder, but just understand that when you're playing the organ, that people are going to be talking because it's the only chance they get to see one another. A few months ago, when we were short on offerings, um, I had somebody who said, Pastor, we spend an awful lot on coffee. I think we should get rid of that. That'll help. And I said, no, no, that's one thing we can't get rid of. Because coffee, tea, and the other things we have out there are the things that help people stay for even a few extra minutes, which enables them to create friendships. And if the church is going to be stable and grow, we have to have people that are connected, even if it's only one Sunday, I mean, one day a week and on Sundays. This is what exhortation is. It's when you walk in and you see something in the sanctuary, whether it's the cross, the banners, the candles, the rice, you see something that says it was a really bad week, but I've taken a deep breath and we're going to be okay. That's what this is about. And this is why exhortation becomes so important. The gift of faith. We talked about this in the sermon last week. The spiritual gift of faith is not to be confused with saving faith. All Christians have been given saving faith. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 10. But not all receive the special gift of faith. The word for faith is the, in the New Testament is pistis. It carries the notion of confidence, certainty, trust, and assurance in the object of faith. You want to know who exhibits this spiritual gift of faith? I'm thinking Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. One of my absolute favorite stories, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here they are. They come before the king. The king says, do what I say or I'm going to cast you into the fiery furnace. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go, look, it's nothing personal, king. We think you're a great guy. Obviously, you're king. But here's the thing. We, we worship a God who can save us. Doesn't even have to snap his finger. Just wink. We're saved. But if he doesn't, and we die, we get to go be with him forever and ever. So it's nothing personal, King, but you lose either way. Either he saves us, and now you've lost faith, or we die. You feel really good, but we're with Jesus, and we're not worried about it anymore. And this is when the king decides to heat up the furnace even hotter, because it angered him. And this is the gift of faith. This is the ability to say, I know that, as Martin Luther said, Goods, uh, goods, fame, child, wife, they can take all of this. They've nothing won because the kingdom is ours forever. This is the faith that allows us to live in such a way that we recognize that the stuff in this world is not what's truly important. It's necessary. It allows us to take care of our family, our communities, etc., but it's not the end all. 
The gift of faith is rooted in one's saving faith in Christ and the trust that comes through your relationship with the Savior. Those with this gift have a trust and confidence in God that allows them to live boldly for Him. This gift is given to those who will face greater challenges and obstacles in their life because they are who they are. This is where when you look at Mother Teresa and Billy Graham and some of these great figures, you understand they were, we were given a faith to handle everything in our life. Psalm 139, every day of my life has been written in your book. They were given enough faith to get through everything that they were going to face. And when God says God will not give you more than you can handle the rest of the verses, he will always provide a way of escape. If you run past the giant flashing exit sign, nothing God's going to do about it. He might put another exit further down, but he gave you the exit. If you choose not to take the exit, then you can't blame God. In the Bible, the gift of faith is often accompanied by great works of faith. In Acts 3, 1 to 10, we see the gift in action when Peter sees a lame man at the beautiful gate, calls on him to stand up and walk in the name of Jesus. Jesus said even a small amount of this faith could move mountains. Paul echoed this truth in 1 Corinthians 13, 2. The Holy Spirit distributes the gift to some in the church to encourage and build up the church in her confidence in God. Those with the gift of faith trust that God is good. They take him at his word and put the full weight of their lives in his hands. They expect God to move and are not surprised when he answers a prayer or performs a miracle. Now, this, by the way, is again where you also need the gift of discernment. So somebody walks in on Sunday morning, they say, I have the gift of faith. We say, that's great. And they say, here's the thing. God told me that you were to tear everything down on this corner and you're to build a new 15-story building with everything in it and God will provide the funds. But first, you got to take the first step and you need to tear everything down and then God will reward you by giving you the money. So in other words, the money is going to come after you tear everything down. This is where then we need somebody with the gift of discernment to come in and say, okay, we need you to discern and make sure they're not related or, you know, they're getting paid by each other. We need to make sure that what this individual is telling us is true. This really is important because people have walked into this church at various times and places and said, I think God told us to do this. And sometimes my faith wasn't enough to take a bold step. Whether or, not, whether or not it was a mistake for me not to allow that step to be taken or whether it was the right thing, I won't know till I get to heaven. But this is where we're constantly analyzing who we are. And so if somebody has the gift of faith, we need somebody with the gift of discernment to make sure that what we're hearing, because we'll have, we'll have people come in here all the time telling us what we need to do. The question is, As you know, as I talked about the individual that was here several months ago, that um, his gift, by the way, was knowing what a church should be. And he flat out told Kayla, your church needs to add this, this and this before I will consider being a member here. We had to feed him lunch. We had had a couple other things. And it was very obvious that all of this was about his comfort, not about the church. We said right down there. The Methodists already have a lunch, and they already have a choir, and they have a couple other things you asked for, so we think it'd be best if you found a church down there. We don't know where he went from there. But it was interesting because one of the things you need to understand is, everybody look back, see those chairs that are stacked at the back there in front of the pictures? He crawled up and was sitting on one of those chairs and said, well, I was late to church, so I couldn't come in. And then during the sermon, he, Kayla kept saying, let's go out in the narthex, and he wanted to talk right there. It's one of those things where we go, well, you know, if God's going to speak to us, I also trust, by the way, if God really wants us like Jonah, he wants this church to go and do something, he'll make sure that we get it done. We just don't have to be swallowed by a whale first. Healing. Spiritual gift of healing found in 1 Corinthians 12, 9 is actually plural in the Greek. It's charismata amaton. It literally is translated gifts of healing. The spiritual gift is closely related to the gifts of faith and miracles. All spiritual gifts are exercised in faith, but gifts of healings involve a special measure. This gift is interesting in that there is no guarantee that a person will always be able to heal anyone. It is subject to the will of God. So last week, we have a couple of doctors in the church. One of them was leaving, and I just said, hey, doc, we're going to be talking about the gifts of healing. How do you feel about that? And he says, 
I always go with, and he told me who came up with this quote, he says, I just put the band-aids on, God does the healing. Now, I love that because when I go to the doctor, I used to be a big fan of watching House MD because they were always guessing, and most of the time they got it wrong until they got it right. And oftentimes when I go to the doctor, you know, and this is one of my, you know, hey, doc, every time I do this, it hurts. And, you know, and you know what the doc says? Then don't do that. Okay. What I, what I'm, you know, but if he's a really good doctor, he'll say, okay, let's analyze your range of motion. Now, does it hurt in the shoulder? Does it hurt here? Where does it hurt? Okay. Let's take an x-ray. Let's do, you know, this, an ultrasound. Hey, you know what? You stretched a muscle. Uh, you know, keep this here. Get one of these braces. Go about three weeks, and then I need you to do these exercises, and you'll be fine. Okay? Now, that's the gifts of healing. But, you know, it's different because in the Scriptures, most of the time when we see the gifts of healing, what we see first, by the way, is they've tried everything possible. They've gone to every doctor. They've gone to every shaman. They've gone to every woman who has, you know, has, has promised anything, any man who promised anything, and their child, their servant, their mother, their father can't be saved. That's when they come to Jesus. The disciples were given authority to heal and cast out demons, but they were not always successful. The Apostle Paul was not able to heal himself and was told God's presence was sufficient. If healing is not granted, then we can conclude that God has greater plans for letting the person go through the illness or infirmity. This isn't about you not having enough faith. And therefore, you know, and this is every time we, we had an individual here years ago whose son had a lifelong chronic illness. And we had Benny Hinn come in and he was going to do a revival and she came to me and she said, is it a sin for me to go and try to get my son healed? And I said, no. However, if he is not healed, I do not want you coming back and saying it was because you or he did not have enough faith. I said, that's their excuse that they're going to throw on you. You didn't give enough money. You didn't have enough faith. You know, you're not part of our exclusive club. That's why you're not healed. It's all on you. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, remember when they said, hey, who sinned, this guy or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus says, it's not. This is so that God can be praised. That's where we have to understand. There were all sorts of people that were told. By the way, if you remember, when Jacob spends the night wrestling with God, before he's able to cross the river, God basically disjoints his hip and gives him a limp. For the rest of his life, he had to bear the scar, this proud, vain individual who's never had to say no to anything because he could do anything, now has to limp the rest of his life as a reminder that he's reliant on God. When we see this gifts of healing, sometimes we get healed, sometimes we don't. Ultimately, we always get healed. 20-something years ago, we had a young girl in the preschool, and her sister had a disease that was fatal. It was brain cancer for a little girl. They weren't members of the church, but they'd asked me, and so I went to visit her down at Kapiolani over and over again, and the day came when the phone rang, and they said that she was dead, and I was headed up through the parking lot my office was over here and I was going to get in the car, go down to be with the family. And our preschool teacher popped out and she said, how's this young girl doing? I said, she just died. And this preschool teacher literally fell onto the ground and she said, that's a lie. God told me she was going to be healed. And I said, she was. It's just not an earthly healing where we get to keep her for the rest of her life. Death is healing. It says, God says that it is precious in the sight of God is the death of his saints. And that's one of the things that we have to understand that healing always comes. It just doesn't always come the way we want it to and the how we want it to. The spiritual gift of healing is intimate. It reveals the heart and compassion of God. Jesus is the great healer and the physician. And during his ministry on earth, he healed countless people and cast out demons. And most of the time, not always, but most of the time, he did it by touch. 
And that wasn't because he needed to touch them. It was that personal. There were the times when he said, you know what? You showed great faith. By the time you get home, your daughter's going to be well. Your servant's going to be well. They're fine, and they get back. But most of the time, this was personal because God wanted the individual to know, I care about you. The struggle between demons and epilepsy in Mark 9 we had a few weeks ago. When the father is describing what happens to his son, all of us would look at that. And anybody, anyone who, by the way, if any of you have ever known anybody with epilepsy and have seen epileptic seizures, you know that he was describing an epileptic seizure. Now, I'm not questioning whether there was a demon or not, because it says in the Bible, God cast the demon out. But a lot of these things that when we read, we say we know exactly what disease or what illness that is. Sometimes I believe they are caused by demons. Other times it's physical. and Maybe there's a connection that we always don't see. But this is where we always look back and we see the need for God to work in the lives of these individuals because he may not take away the illness, but he can take away the demon, which means the person is now at peace even with the illness or the disease. Those who have this gift are compassionate toward the sick, pray for those they are working with. Their ultimate concern is the spiritual well-being of those being healed. They yearn for the day when there will be no more pain and suffering and sin will no longer have power over the people of God. Ultimately, all disease and sicknesses is caused by sin. But as Jesus said, not necessarily did this individual or his parents or his grandparents or anybody else sin that brought about his blindness. And we have to be careful about that as well. But all these things in the world today, it's caused by our sin. And this is why the first thing Jesus does oftentimes, he says, your sins are forgiven. It's like, well, thanks, Jesus. How about, you know, curing me? He says, oh, you want that? I can do that too. But understand, that's temporary. It's only going to last the rest of your life. But you being forgiven is eternal. All right, we're going to hold off there. And next week, we'll pick up with the next one. And uh, this is, like I said, this is just a beautiful section as we go through each of those, because each one of these, we realize, hey, I have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Ooh, I'm strong in that area. Oh, I'm really weak in this area, especially when it says compassionate. You have to be a compassionate healer. You have to be compassionate in evangelism. We'll go in peace, serve the Lord in gladness. Have a wonderful week and uh, enjoy the heat and the humidity.